Uh, we're going to spend some time um, in the Word. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking about a topic. We're in a series entitled, But God, and it's really just trying to infuse hope uh, because we believe that when you add God, there is hope. When you add God, there is hope. Where there was no hope, once you add God, there is hope. Uh, so we're in a series entitled, But God, we're on Sermon 7, and we're going to lean into that in just a moment. And with the sermon, I'll give you an overview of how we're going to approach that. An outline is available on YouTube. Outline is also available on an app that we call YouVersion. Uh, and you can download that for free and utilize uh, the sermon notes. Uh, but I want to take a moment just to highlight uh, an announcement just to prepare us. Uh, I am so thankful for so many things. So I'll give you a short version. So thankful for so many things. This year uh, in May will be 25 years that I've been at St. Paul. <laughs> this is crazy, right? <laughs> crazy, right? And in the course of that, God has stretched me, and I am so thankful for the faithfulness and the patience of St. Paul and uh, its membership uh, to partner with this 26-year-old boy uh, and grow together, right, in relationship, uh, in service to our God and our King and to this community. And I'm thankful for that. And during the course of my time here, I've been blessed to have opportunities to do a number of things, uh, but been blessed to have the opportunity to go back and finish a degree. My uh, Master's of Divinity degree, it took me 10 years to complete, but we finished it, <laughs> right? Took 10 years, right? From 94 to 2004, but we finished it. And over the last three and a half years, I've had the privilege uh, to uh, work on my doctorate of ministry degree. So um, I mentioned that. Praise God. Thank you guys so much. Um, I mentioned that because I'm coming, on, coming to the end of the degree. And as I'm coming to the end where I need to do research and then write, things of that nature, uh, one of the suggestions from my mentor, I ignored a lot of other suggestions that he gave me during this process, but this one I gave in to, and I see the wisdom in it. One of the uh, uh, suggestions that he gave was that when I get to the place of writing, that I take a sabbatical, that I pull away from my day-to-day -day responsibilities within ministry and the life of the church so that I can focus my attention on completing this degree. So I share that to say as I try to finish out this last leg of the race, doing research and writing, in the month of March and the first Sunday in April, I'm going to take a five-week sabbatical. Amen. So just want you to be aware. Um, we already have, we're so blessed to have some of our friends who are coming in to preach on that Sunday. My plan is to be here on that Sunday to receive with you. But during the week, I'm going to be somewhere tucked away, just trying to write, to understand the research, and to do my best to finish this task that I have before me. I mention it, one, for you to be aware. Uh, sometimes, you know, people say, we didn't know, and that's really, I want you to know that March, first Sunday in April, I will not be present. God will be present. The Word will be present. Your life will be changed, amen. Uh, so I want you to know, but I also want you to know so you can pray, so you can partner with me in prayer, uh, that I maximize that time to do what I need to do. Uh, short version of explanation. My degree will be in pastor care, and my passion and desire is to walk along pastors to provide support, prayer, and care. Pastors are some of the loneliest people in society. They don't feel like they have anybody they can trust, and they need people that they can trust who will provide care and support to them. So that's my desire that in the next leg of my race that I can graciously be able to come alongside pastors. So uh, five weeks, March, first Sunday in April, we're taking a sabbatical. We ask for your prayers, but want you to be aware uh, of what's going on and be able to receive what God is going to do during that five-week period. Is that all good? All right. Thank you all so much. Man, praise God. Thank you all. Man, praise God. Praise God. 
Did not expect that, but praise God. Uh, so, uh, so for our word today, uh, as we jump in today, um, um, I want to approach this topic of broken relationships but God. Broken relationships but God, because when you add God to the equation, there is hope broken relationships. Most of us, almost all of us, because we are human, we understand that you don't go through life for the most part without some broken relationships. All of us have broken relationships, whether it's on our job, whether it's in our family, uh, sometimes it's our friendships, uh, but we experience broken relationships, relationships that at one time were strong, we were close, and something happened. There was an offense of some sort that created a divide that caused some tension. And for whatever reason, we were not able or did not make the choice to mend that relationship, to heal that relationship, to reconcile that relationship. Strangely enough, broken relationships start real early. I was talking to uh, one of what I call my grandchildren, a child of uh, one of the many uh, children who are now adults that uh, I have invited into my life and call them my child and they give me the privilege uh, of them calling me dad. And I was, I was talking to one of my grandchildren and uh, just asking about her day with school. And uh, in the midst of talking about her day in school, she said, Papa, such and such, and she named the person, she said, they won't play with me anymore. And I said, really? I said, why won't they play with you? She said, I don't know, but we used to play together all the time. But now they won't play with me. They play with the other children and won't play with me. She's young, but she's having on the inside of her this awareness that sometimes you have broken relationships. Sometimes you have partners where you play together and you cry together and, and you do life together. And then something happens. And once that thing happens, it changes the nature of your relationship. Wow, over the last three years or so, many of us know that our relationships have been stretched, haven't they? Over the last three years or so, can, can we acknowledge that there have been a whole bunch of tension in relationships? The, the political landscape has created a whole bunch of opportunities for tension, the polarization within our society. There are some people three and a half, four years ago we used to call friend, but we made sure that we unfriended them on Facebook. We no longer talk to them because of political views and perspectives, broken relationships. Not, not only the political landscape, I mean the racial tension that continues to rise to show its ugly face in America. Hasn't it created opportunity for broken relationships? People are having debates and dialogue and discussions about various issues related to race. And, and sometimes because we don't know how to have the conversation or we have assumptions about the conversation or we don't know how to listen to others, it creates tension and, and causes some breaks in relationship. And some of us, we, we, we don't even acknowledge that there was a break. We just move on. We just avoid, but some of the racial turmoil that has occurred over the last three or four years showed its face yet again has created broken relationships. Strangely enough, a pandemic has caused broken relationships. Strangely enough, a pandemic in the world where people are dying and getting sick and it's impacting us economically, strangely enough, hasn't it caused some, some broken relationships, right? People are in camps masked or unmasked, vaccinated or unvaccinated, right? It, it's caused broken relations. Am I talking to any real people? 
It's caused broken relationships. Broken relationships on the job. You no longer go to the coffee corner or water spot if you're meeting in person. And if you're online, you get online just in time to not have to have small talk because of broken relationships. And the question becomes, do we believe that there is hope for broken relationships? Can broken relationships be healed? Is there help for us in this space of broken relationships, whether it's something that's emerged over the last few years, whether it's things that have been occurring for a long period of time, whether it's in our family, whether it's on our job, whether it's in our neighborhood, whether it's in our churches. Oh, don't talk about the broken relationships in the church, right? Wherever it may be, is there hope for our relationships to be healed, to be mended, to be reconciled? And I want to suggest whether you are a follower of Christ, because I realize many people who may catch us on YouTube or who may show up, you're not really sure yet whether you believe in Jesus and everything we say about Jesus. Not necessarily sold about what we believe in God and the things we believe about God, but, but you either like some people and as a result you tuned in or, or you get something out of it so you kind of check us out. So even if you don't have a conviction yet about Jesus, a conviction yet about God, I think there are some good things that we can learn to help us in our relationships. But I'm going to suggest that when we look at the example of what God has done in reconciling humanity to to himself, there are some great things we can learn from his example that can encourage our hearts as it relates to relationships. So let's talk generally before we talk specifically. When we talk about broken relationships, again, we're talking about where there is some kind of hostility, some kind of alienation, some kind of lack of harmony. We're we're, we're talking about where at one point you were friends, but now you are foes, whether you state it or not. And we talk about this idea of mending or healing or reconciliation. We're talking about a coming back together so that we are in harmony. We're talking about a coming back together so that we are once again friends. Charles Ryrie, in talking about reconciliation, says it's a change of relationship from hostility to harmony and, from, and to peace between parties. So here are some things I would suggest I would offer up generally. If you're in relationships, if you're human, you're in relationships, and you have some tension in your relationships, you have some broken relationships, I want to offer up some things, some suggestions that I think may be helpful, right, for the relationship, for you to move towards some potential healing, some potential mending, and then we'll get to the example of God and talk about why the example of God is so encouraging. So here are the things generally that can help us. If you find yourself in a relationship where you have some brokenness, some, some mending needs to take place. You're, you're no longer friends, but you are now foes. Here are some steps you can take to mend that relationship. The first step I want to encourage you to take is make the first move. Make the first move. I want to encourage you to take the initiative. Can we acknowledge that oftentimes pride hinders us from making the first move, from taking the initiative. We are aware that we are no longer friends like we once were and we have become foes. We are aware that there is hostility, but oftentimes pride keeps us from taking that first step and taking the initiative pride that says, I shouldn't have to be the one to say something. They know just like I know that things are messed up. They know just like I know that things went wrong. They should do it. And pride and arrogance and lack of humility can cause us to not take the initiative or make the first move to say, you know what? I notice that we are not where we used to be. Can we talk about it? Right? Seems innocent. Can we, can we just talk about that there was a break Can we just talk about that there was an offense? Can we just talk about it? So just making the first move. Here's the second step I would encourage you to do. If you experience any kind of broken relationships, whether you're young or mature in age, the second thing I would encourage you to do, take the initiative, right? And in taking the initiative, secondly, acknowledge the hurt or the offense. 
acknowledge that there is something that took place. And in the acknowledgement of the hurt or the offense, hear this, the goal is to attack the problem, not the person. The goal is to attack the problem, not the person. The goal is to address the offense, to address the hurt, not to attack the person. So how do we address the offense and not attack the person? Well, under that, I think uh, just talking about what went wrong, right? And being able to listen to say, I just want to hear from your perspective what went wrong. Wrong, being able to listen, and because we are in relationship with one another, if we're going to acknowledge that there's a hurt and we're asking what went wrong and we're going to listen, then as we listen, hopefully we recognize because there are two of us in the relationship that there is a part for us to own. Right? It, it didn't go south just because of you. It went south because we're in relationship and both of us made choices, so listening for what's the part for us to own, and then in the acknowledgement, this is the harder part, then apologizing. Because I see what I need to own, then I want to apologize for my part. Someone has suggested that an apology has uh, three major components, accountability, uh, vulnerability, and empathy. Accountability, I am accountable for what I did. It's on me, right? Vulnerability, here is why I did it. I may not have looked at it from your perspective. I may not have been able to see how you see it, but now that I see it, empathy says, now that I see it the way you see it or hear it the way you hear it, then I want to apologize for missing it. It's the whole idea of being able to acknowledge the offense and address it. Number three, agree on what will make things right. Being able to agree on a path towards mending, being able to agree on a path towards healing, a path towards wholeness, right? And in agreement, ag agreeing that, you know what? As we move towards healing and wholeness because reconciliation and mending of relationship and healing of a relationship is a process, it doesn't just occur in a moment, but it occurs in a process. Because of that, then as we move together towards restoring this relationship, here is what we want to do. We want to acknowledge that I'm human and you're human. And because I'm human, and you're a human, there will be other things as we journey together that will come up that will trouble you about me. And there will be things as we journey together that will trouble me about you. So it's the acknowledgement that we are human and because we acknowledge that we are human, we agree on rules of engagement. Because we're human, then we're gonna, we're gonna give each other, in church we call it grace. We're gonna give each other favor. I'm, I'm going to recognize that you are human, and because you are human, just as we discussed before, that there are some things that occur that you don't see the way I see, and you don't understand the way I understand, then I'm going to allow you to articulate to me what happens when I'm rubbed the wrong way. I'm going to give you room to have voice so that I don't take it and bury it and walk away with it and then pour into it everything that I'm thinking. No, instead of me filling in the blanks, I'm going to give you opportunity to speak for yourself. So many problems occur in life and in relationships because instead of asking somebody what did they mean, we fill in the blanks of what we think they mean. So it's this whole issue of being able to agree on the path forward, and then fourthly, being able to forgive. Here's the beauty of forgiveness. Forgiveness can take place with just one person. I don't need you for me to forgive you. I don't. That's a choice I make. Reconciliation, we need both people. But forgiveness, that's a choice I make so after we talked about it and I've been able to hear you, I can agree to release you, to release you from needing to pay that back, needing to address that. I release you because we've worked on an understanding. And then finally, again, generally, just commit to 
restoration or reconciliation. It's this commitment that we're going to walk together. And as we walk together, it's not going to be easy. But we're going to commit to the relationship because we value the relationship. And because we value the relationship and we value one another, then we're going to stick it out. Generally. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, please hear that reconciliation is in your DNA. I'll say it again. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, please hear that reconciliation is in your DNA. God is a reconciler. And because God is a reconciler and we are children of God, reconciliation is in your DNA. So because as followers of Christ, we want to anchor what we understand in Scripture, let me read our Scripture for the day. Romans chapter 5. Beginning at verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have now received this reconciliation through him. So if you are a follower of Christ, reconciliation is in your DNA. Your daddy is a reconciler. And our daddy has called us to reconciliation. Our daddy has shown us by his example how to remove the hostility that separates people and then bring them back to one another. So for those of us who are followers of Christ, how can the example of God help us? For those who may not be followers of Christ, for those who may just be thinking about God, how does what God has done provide an example for us that can motivate us, encourage us in this space of reconciliation? I'm glad you asked the question. Notice the points are very similar. Romans chapter 5 and what we read in Scripture communicates this whole notion that God, by example, took the initiative. God took the initiative, and hear this, God took the initiative because of love. Now, understand that when, when in the Bible we talk about God's love, we're talking about unconditional love. Somebody online, can you just type in the comment section, unconditional means no conditions. Unconditional means no conditions. God did what he did in taking the initiative because of love. He was motivated by Love. He so loved humanity, right? That's the good news that we proclaim, that famous passage, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that what? He did something. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God took the initiative and God did it because of love. Well, how does that help us as we think back to the steps about taking the initiative? See, generally, if I'm not a Christ follower or generally if I don't believe in God, then I may get the idea, okay, I need to take the initiative. I need to take the first step. I, I need to move first. I get that. But as a follower of Christ who has reconciliation in my DNA, then I understand that I'm always motivated by love. 
I'm always motivated by the fact that irregardless of how I behave, God loves me. As you hear the scripture in Romans 5, while I was still a sinner, still ungodly, right? Still an enemy, Christ died for me. God loves me unconditionally. So when I think about my relationship with you, I may not be able to be like God and love you unconditionally, but the unconditional love of God should influence me and challenge me and change my head and my heart so that even when I see the fact that at times you just like me are unlovable, I remind myself if God loved me when I was unlovable and God poured his love in me, then who am I not to come towards you because you are showing me that you are human just like me? See, the example of God is Love is what causes us to take the initiative. Oh, thank you, God. So sometimes, sometimes I have to, my check, I don't know about your check, my check sometimes, because God, sometimes God just, he body slams me. I appreciate people who have that relationship with God where God whispers to them, right? But I'm a stubborn child. So God body slams me. And sometimes God has to body slam me and say, so, Hub, you don't, you don't love them enough to pursue them? Is, is that it? it you, you, you can't find it in you to love them enough to value the relationship with them? Is that what's going on? I know we don't have a love problem, Hub. Because we have a love problem, Hub, we have a problem. Because it's all about love. How are you going to say that you are a child of the God who is love and you can't love, huh? I mean, it's all about being able to love, huh? If we got a love problem, we got a problem. I'm like, ugh, as I pick myself up off the ground. God, you have my attention. So the example of God is God takes the initiative because of love that should help us, motivate us to be challenged, driven by the idea of love. Love causes me to do oftentimes what I may not normally choose to do. But because of love, here's the second thing we see. In the example of God, please understand, because we looked at what's the offense? Humanity's offense against God is rebellion. So uh, if you've never read uh, the book of Romans, Romans is a letter in the Bible uh, that Paul writes by the guidance of the Spirit to Christians who are in Rome. And what he's trying to basically do is communicate this good news message and why it's relevant for them and then how it plays out in their lives. So he makes a case. He's writing an argument. So what he does, Romans chapter 1, is he highlights just God's activity. And then after highlighting God's activity, he highlights the rebellion of humanity towards God. So I just want to read a a few verses in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since Since what can be known about God is evident among them, Because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. So what he does in chapter 1 is to say that God has revealed himself. God has made himself known in creation, the sun, the moon, the stars. As you look around and you see the earth and you see the plants and you see the animals, God has made himself known. And because God has made himself himself known. And even though you have evidence of God, you see the fingerprint of God in creation. You've made a decision to turn from the God who has made himself known. He goes on to say, and instead create little gods in your own image. He says, that's rebellion, humanity. 
And then he goes on to say, you know what, I just want those of you who are religious, those of you who practice a sense of morality, those of you who abide by laws, I want you, chapter 2, to understand that you are likewise guilty, that you are likewise guilty of rebellion because even though God has given you standards, you've rejected those standards, and in rejecting those standards, you have rejected God. Not just the religious can I talk to, he says, the non-religious, those of you who may not be religious, but because you have a sense of morality, you have a sense of good and right. You have a sense of right and wrong because you have a sense of, of, of morality and you understand right from wrong, then, then God has placed that on the inside of you and your ability to know right and wrong and still reject the God who has given you a sense of right and wrong is rebellion. And then in chapter 3, he just lays it all out. He says, please know that all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. Please know that there is none who meets the standards of God. No, not one. So what he does is he lays a case to highlight that humanity has been in rebellion against God from the beginning. So what's the offense? The offense is rebellion against God. Well, how do we address that? If we're going to address the offense, let the example of God. Humanity couldn't make things right. So the interesting thing about Scripture as you look at the offense, the offense is humanity's rebellion against God. The Bible calls that sin. The idea of sin is missing the mark. So you, you think of uh, if you're shooting an arrow at a target, right, the goal is to hit the bullseye. That's the goal. And, and, and when you miss the bullseye, you've missed the mark. You've sinned. It doesn't matter if you're that far away from the bullseye or that far away from the bullseye is still sin, rebellion against God. Humanity cannot address our own sin problem. So what God does in the Old Testament is God reminds the people of Israel, he says, hey, every time you shoot and miss the mark, we got to address that. Here's how we're going to address that, because life is in the blood. We're going to get a sacrifice, an animal that is perfect, and we're going to offer the blood of that animal to acknowledge we shot, we missed the mark, we are sorry, God, we apologize. He says that's going to be the system to acknowledge that we've missed the mark. So he embeds within them this system that every time there is a shooting and missing of the mark, there needs to be the shedding of blood and acknowledgement that we missed the mark to say, God, we are accountable to you. We owe you for that. And they have to continue the system because there's no way to pay once and for all for the sin of humanity until God provides the sacrifice. So what we read in Romans is that there is an offense. Humanity has rebelled against God. We've taken our shot again and again and missed the mark, and there needs to be payment for that. But we don't have it in our account to pay. So God says, I can't change the standard, but what I'll do is I'll pay your debt for you. God says, I'll give a sacrifice, my son, and strangely enough, in the scripture to connect to the system. John, the writer says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God says, I'll give my son who will shed his blood that will serve as payment for your sin. Humanity could not address the problem. Mm. So God says, because of love, I will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. So how, how, did, how does that help me? Understanding the offense, right? Understanding the rebellion. Understanding that humanity can't pay it, but God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. That serves as motivation for us. 
We think about all that God has done to reconcile humanity to himself, to make it possible for us to be in relationship with him, how he's done for us what we could not do for ourselves. It serves as motivation in our relationships to say, you know what, I know the step that I'm taking towards you is a sacrifice, but it's a small sacrifice when I consider what God has done for me. I know that in order for me to draw, you keep running from me, you keep hiding, you don't want to address the issue, but that's all right. I'm going to keep coming towards you. It's a small sacrifice considering what God has done for me. So the example of God provides motivation and encouragement because as I consider his sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus the Christ, his shed blood on our behalf, it encourages my heart to say whatever I do, in pursuit of a reconciling relationship with you. I do because I understand the sacrifice that has been made for me. And I accept that I can't force you to reconcile with me. I can only do as much as possible in me to be reconciled with you. I can't demand it, I can't require it, but I must pursue it because God has pursued me. Here's the last thing that I'll share, and then I'll prepare to close out. Example of God. God, who reconciled us to himself while we're at our worst, commits to be in our corner and supports us to be at our best going forward. So what you read in Romans chapter 5 is Paul giving an argument from the greater to the lesser. Here's the argument he has. If God, while you were ungodly, while you were an enemy, while you were a sinner, would send his son Christ to die for humanity, to shed his blood, which is for all sin and all sinners, to die for humanity, to shed his blood. If he does that for you while you're still ungodly, while you're still sinners, while you're still enemies, here is his argument, greater to lesser, how much more won't he do for you now that you are his children. You hear the argument, right? If he did all that for you, when you were turn your back on him and wouldn't turn towards him, now that you've placed your confidence, your hope, your faith in Christ, how much more won't he do for you now? And maybe that becomes a challenge because in reality, a part of the challenge in humanity is we have not accepted the opportunity to be reconciled with God, right? And Scripture declares it's it's by faith, it's by trusting in, believing in, God, this way that you've provided for me to be in relationship with you, this really does work. And because I believe it, I place my confidence in it, I commit to it, and I trust it. The challenge is that many have not accepted the invitation of God to be reconciled with him. You see, the but God is that when I accept what God has done for me in making it available for me to be reconciled to him, it makes it so much easier. I am empowered because God helps me to be reconciled with other people. There is hope. When I consider I was an enemy, I was ungodly, I was a sinner, and God changed me. Reconciliation is about God's ability to change people. There is hope in my relationships with other people because I know if God changed me, he can change other people. And what has been broken can be mended. What has been broken can be healed. What has been broken can be reconciled. And for some of us, whether online or in person, We just haven't accepted the invitation yet. There's a movie that I love. It causes me to laugh uh, like never before. Uh, It's called Talladega Nights. (laughs) Don't judge. Don't judge. It's one of my favorite movies, Talladega Nights. Uh, It features uh, uh, the character, Ricky Bobby, who is a NASCAR racer. And uh, he has a traumatic childhood. Uh, but it leads him into racing, and he has a strained relationship with his father. 
But Ricky Bobby believes that uh, he's going to be one of the greatest racers of all times. And he does indeed become one of the greatest racers of all time in the movie. And because Ricky Bobby, at, at his very core, at his very heart, desires for his father to be able to see his accomplishment, to enjoy his accomplishment, then, then he makes an invitation again and again to his father for his father to come out and just watch him race. He, he says to his dad, dad, when I get there, I want you to be there so you could see it. So here is my invitation. Anytime I'm racing, please know that there will be a ticket for you in the box office. All you have to do is go and give them your name. The ticket will always be there because I want to invite you to enjoy this privilege, to be able to see what I'm doing and celebrate with me. And race after race, after race, after race, unfortunately, Ricky Bobby leaves that ticket for his dad, and his dad never shows up to accept the ticket. He never accepts the invitation to enjoy the privilege that has been laid before his son. For many of us, we don't recognize that God has issued an invitation to humanity. God has said, everything that I've done is because of love. I, I sent my son to die to shed his blood to pay the price for your sin, for our sin, for the sin of humanity, that you might be in relationship with me. You couldn't do it for yourself. You couldn't pay the debt yourself, but I'll pay the debt. Not only will I pay the debt, but then I'll issue an invitation and let you know whenever you're ready, I'm standing right here with open arms, ready to receive you. And look, whenever you're ready, all you have to do is say, Lord, I believe. Place your faith, your hope, your confidence, trust in what I have done for you. And in that moment, you will be brought into proper relationship with me. And how much more will I do for you as you are my child? My prayer this morning is that you would accept God's invitation, if you've never accepted his invitation, to be reconciled with him. My prayer is that you would accept his invitation. If you have accepted his invitation, then I want to offer you another prayer. I want to offer you a prayer for you to consider, to wrestle with as you ponder this message. Because you may have some broken relationships. So I'm going to pray it and you listen and think about it. And as you listen and think about it, ponder if this is something you want to pray. It simply says, Daddy, today's message has reminded me of my broken relationship with, and you fill in the name. You see how fractured our relationship is. Father, I now confess the mistakes I've made in my relationship with, and you put in their name. I confess to you that at times I have been too harsh, critical, sarcastic, opinionated, or controlling. Uproot these attitudes in me, I pray. I receive your forgiveness, Lord. Holy Spirit, show me what it looks like to humble myself and apologize. Help me not to allow any bitterness to creep into my heart. Show me what it looks like to make amends. Just as you went to great lengths to reconcile me to yourself, help me to go the extra mile to be reconciled with, and you fill in their name. Show me exactly what I need to do, Lord. I surrender to you. I pray that you fill in their name, would experience your love and blessing today. I pray that and you fill in their name, will be open to your Holy Spirit regarding reconciliation. As you have reconciled me to you, I pray that you will help me and fill in their name to experience the joy of reconciliation. Amen. As we prepare this morning to worship God in song, I pray that the love of God that we have received, the love of God from our God who is the reconciler, 
who has made it possible for humanity to be in proper relationship with him would be a motivation and an encouragement to us to know that if God can do a work in us to change us and bring us into proper relationship with him, then God likewise can do a work in us and the people we're in relationship with to cause those relationships that were broken to be healed, to be restored, to be reconciled. Let's trust him for that today.